And so you should think through what your responses are going to be when they eventually come to you and say, I think I want to search for my biological family members because while they may not say it to you out loud, they've probably thought about it. If they've come to you and said it, they've thought about it enough that they're probably going to do it, whether you are supportive or not. And I think it's better for you if you can find yourself in a place of being supportive because what you will then have done if you're not supportive is sliced yourself out of a significant piece of your adopted child's life. Your dream is to become a mom. My dream is to help you get there. I'm Rebecca Greenspan, a single mom through domestic adoption and an adoption consultant for over a decade. I'll be your guide, along with other adoption professionals and members of the Adoption Constellation, walking you step-by-step step down this beautiful and complex path of adopting your baby. When I was going through the adoption process, I had no idea what I was doing, what I needed to know, or more importantly, who to trust. Well, after helping hundreds and hundreds of families grow through the beauty and complexity of adoption, I've learned more than a thing or two, and let me tell you, it's not always rainbows and butterflies. This isn't just another podcast sharing adoption stories, but it's for you if you're genuinely committed to diving in with an open heart, eager to learn everything there is to know about adopting a baby so that you can show up for yourself and your child in the best way possible. This podcast is for you if you're ready to put your newfound knowledge into action. Adoption isn't for the weak of heart, and it certainly isn't done when your baby gets placed in your arms. If that's what you think, I'm afraid you're living in la-la land. My promise to you is to keep it real if you promise to keep digging. We'll acknowledge the hard and we'll also celebrate the joy that is adoption. You ready? Let's do this. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Damon Davis, a key voice in the adoption community and the creator of the poignant Who Am I Really podcast. On his podcast, Damon provides a platform for adoptees to share their diverse experiences from challenging adoptions to heartwarming reunions and has reached an impressive milestone with over 230 episodes spanning 14 seasons. Damon is not only a podcaster, but also an author and adoptive parent. In his autobiography, Who Am I Really?, an adoptee memoir, he reveals his emotional journey through adoption, the joy of becoming a father to his son, Seth, and the complexity of his relationships with both his adoptive and biological families. His story is one of resilience and discovery, including the heart-trending task of dealing with his adoptive mother's mental illness juxtaposed with the joy of finding his biological parents. His mother, in a serendipitous reunion on her birthday, and his father, through DNA testing, a quest filled with twists and unforeseen revelations. Aside from his personal and professional achievements, Damon plays a significant role in the adoption community as the Metro DC chapter board president of the Gift of Adoption Fund, where I met him. This charity is committed to forming families by providing grants for adopting children in vulnerable situations, ensuring that every dollar donated directly supports these crucial efforts. Join us as Damon shares insights from his own experiences and the powerful stories he has encountered through his work, shedding light on the complex emotions and profound truths about the adoption journey. Damon, I am so glad to have you on our podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Rebecca. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. That was really kind. You are so welcome. I want to jump right in. What inspired you to start the Who Am I Really podcast? And how did you envision it helping adoptees? 
uh, it's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked because I think it gets lost on folks why they start a show. I think it gets lost on the audience. And <laughs> so what happened for me was I had gone on this adoption reunion journey and I started to have these amazing experiences telling my story to so many people in the public. I would talk to random folks on the street and I would talk to my colleagues and I would talk to, you know, family members and others. And most of the time people would say, Oh my gosh, your story is amazing. That sounds like a book. It sounds like a movie. This is incredible. But every once in a while, someone would say to me something along the lines of your story is so amazing, but that will never happen to me. And they would say, mm. I'm adopted too, but unfortunately my parents don't want it. My birth parents don't want to know me. I found them. They don't want to connect. Uh, I'm scared to look because my adoptive family has basically said, you know, you're ours. Uh, I'm afraid to look because I don't know what I'll find. I have tried and tried and tried and, and I've never found anything. I've searched and unfortunately I found a grave. And it was in this interaction with other people who were adopted where I realized that I had sort of subscribed to this, what I call the Disney version of adoption, right? There's this amazing adoption and this incredible reunion, which I had basically lived, but that that's not the case for every person. And that many people end up with some variation of the adoption story where things did not go to the Disney script. And so it was in that storytelling of my own that I realized everybody's got a story to tell and that we are, if I was subscribing to that inappropriate version of what adoption is, then many other people were. And that it's the real stories of how adoptions actually unfold that need to come out. So I decided that I would take my time and try to talk to as many adopted people as possible just to learn more from myself, but also to help to share some of those alternative narratives that most people aren't familiar with. And it's been an amazing experience. I've, I've spoken to, as you've said, over 230 adopted people. And I've learned so much about adoption, how humans treat each other, how amazing we can be towards one another and how completely awful folks can be and, and in an array of different life experiences therein. So the show has been absolutely incredible, but I, I gotta be honest with you. I did not set out to create sort of a global platform that I now have. I said to myself, if I'm gonna start this, I just need to touch one person and hopefully they will take something from hearing another person's story and then I will be fulfilled. And thankfully, the community that supports the show is, has been really um, sort of interested and fascinated in the adoption journeys of other people. That's so amazing. I love that. And, and by the way, for those of you watching on YouTube, I'm not in my normal surroundings. I'm, I'm visiting Chicago for the week, which is always a fun thing for me after I drop my son off for camp. And, um, you know, I didn't have my right mic, which is why I'm holding a mic and the lighting and all of that. So um, I'm out of sorts, but we're making it work, which is great. But I love what you said because, you know, I hear adoptees often coming on platforms and speaking for all adoptees. Mm -hmm. And you really, truly only know deeply your own story. And I don't know, perhaps that's what you think adoption is and what everybody else is experiencing until you start talking to other people who have wildly, vastly different stories than your own. Yeah. And I, I would imagine how interesting that was for you to start learning from other people. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting, fascinating, educational, right? Because... You learn about how families are formed in different ways. Yeah. You learn about how different people have had different feelings along the journey. And you learn a lot about our history in adoption. Mm -hmm. What, you know, the baby scoop era was like, what pre-baby scoop uh, 
adoptions were like, what it's attempting to evolve into now, and how folks are advocating more and more. You learn about how people are expressing their voices. They're going on podcasts and writing songs and doing plays and writing books and all kinds of other things that are expanding how folks are able to ingest the narrative. But it's been absolutely eye-opening for me to understand things like international adoption, transracial mm -hmm. adoptions, uh, even in homogenous families where people are of the same race, you get folks who are the tall person in a short family, you know, the heavy person in a skinny family, you get the redhead in a blonde or brunette family, you get all kinds of different variations of uh, likes and dislikes, you get folks who are mathematically inclined in a family full of jocks you mm -hmm. get somebody who wants to be outdoors all the time and be boisterous and loud and and they're in a family of very quiet sort of reserved people it's just it's a fascinating exploration into what almost feels like a anthropological experiment of how I'm you can just... mix different types of people together and yeah. see how they're going to work out or not it, it's socioeconomic background it's religious and and faith-based you could slice it so many different ways it's been eye-opening for sure for sure and, and i mean family dynamics just in general yeah. is is fascinating you mentioned baby scoop era can you just for those people who don't know what you're talking about can you just uh mention what yeah. that is so there was an era in the United States that I believe, and don't quote my dates, but generally through sort of the 50s, 60s, early 70s, yeah, that yeah. was referred to as baby scoop era, which basically means that there was a almost extreme marketplace for adopted children, that there was this preconceived notion that a family would have you know, 3.2 kids in a white picket fence. And so there was a tremendous amount of pressure on young couples to have a child. And unfortunately, if you did not have a child, you were perceived in a negative way by society. And so people felt a lot of pressure to build a family, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody wanted to talk about challenges with inability to conceive. Right. There are we now know there are lots of fertility issues across America for a variety of reasons. My family, you know, lived through it ourselves, but it wasn't something that people spoke about a lot. And so there was this uh, attempt to keep it quiet that you couldn't have a baby. And so a lot of people would, in some cases, you know, fake a pregnancy. And 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 because there was such a marketplace to take children into families there was a significant pressure on young mothers to relinquish children. And so in any marketplace where there's high demand, um, you need to create supply. And unfortunately, many children, I think, were commoditized mm -hmm. as being part of this marketplace. And so what ended up happening was what we now call this baby scoop era. There was a lot of you know, this movement of children from one family structure to another through what I loosely call, you know, the adoption machinery, that when a couple goes into a, a social work office or some other entity that's going to assist with their adoption, uh, the engine turns on and they immediately go out and look for the commodity and, and bring a child for that family to bring home. And there, I'll just say one more thing, there wasn't a lot of vetting and examination into a family at that time. I won't yeah. say that I know how much there is now, but I know there wasn't very much at that time. And that lent itself to a, a lot of mismatches of children to families for a variety of reasons. There are a lot of horrifying stories for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to your podcast, Who Am mm -hmm. I Really? In your experience hosting, what common themes or challenges have emerged among adoptees searching for their biological families? This is a great question because there are so many commonalities and there are so many incongruences across stories because we're all unique. 
Um, I think one, just generally from the show, a lot of adoptees feel or have felt alone until they have found community and they realize, holy crap, there's all these people out here talking about this. So, and that's what's called coming out of the fog, right? It can be, yes, but I, I tend to think of coming out of the fog in a variety of ways because it's not the same for every person, right? Okay. So just to stick with coming out of the fog, and then I'll get back to commonalities in a minute. Great. I've now come to think of coming out of the fog as being less of a moment in time and more of a process because I'll give myself as an example. I grew up with the, the knowledge that I was adopted. I've always known it since I was, for as long as I can remember. Therefore, I grew up knowing my status and accepting it and speaking publicly about it. However, I also, while I was perfectly well adjusted in my family, like I'm black, my mom was light skinned, I'm medium skinned and my dad was dark skinned. We kind of looked like we could be family. Um, when I would go out with my dad, for example, people would say, oh my God, you guys look just alike. But I'm in the back of my mind, I know I'm adopted and I know we don't look alike. So I would appease them and say, you're right. But I had these, these constant reminders in society that I, I was adopted. I say all that to say, it wasn't until my son was born, my first biological relative I had ever known in my entire life was born, that it hit me that I too was a branch on someone else's family tree, the way he was on mine, but I have no idea who those people are. And so this is what I mean by coming out of the fog being a process. I knew from an early age that I was adopted. I accepted it, but would potentially get, for lack of better words, triggered or reminded throughout life. And so it was only until I reached that moment for me that I quote unquote came out of the fog, but it continued because when I eventually found my birth mother, I learned my, what I have come to call chapter one of my story. I got that analogy from another guest who basically said adoptees grow up starting their story in chapter two, where we don't know what the history was that led to the moments that connected us to our adoptive family. So when I discovered my chapter one, that was a continuation of my process. So I think you see what I'm saying, that life continues to give you additional nuggets about your adoption that helps the process along. And, yeah, and it, it can be different for different people. And it's interesting. I don't know that, you know, it's this term is used specifically in adoption or that's the only the only place I've heard it. And yet I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who lost a parent. And she said, that whole year, I don't remember. I don't know what I did. I stopped living, you know, and she had just experienced a trauma. And then a year later, kind of came out of her fog. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, okay. It was kind of an aha moment to me. And I explained to her that this was a term used uh, in adoption a lot. And yet it could also be, you know, it's More very similar to what she experienced. Yeah. So I think I with agree. any kind of trauma, you could have this coming out of the fog um, yeah. experience after after that time. Okay. Yeah. Getting back to um, unexpected yeah, so back. insights or, or themes or I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think a couple of themes that I've heard across adoptee stories are again, one, just this feeling of aloneness until you discover community. Yeah. Right. If I didn't tell, if you and I met at a, you know, at a work meeting or at a, a party and we just talked and I never told you I was adopted, you'd never know. And and, and I'm sure that as we traverse our lives, multiple adopted people have connected with each other and don't even know it. Yeah. So there's that, that piece, which is, um, it can feel very solitary and that can be challenging for folks who are, are in need of some kind of connection. So as to, uh, start to heal from the things that they've been feeling mm -hmm. another commonality is this question 
I've had it said more than once. I'm not just plugging my show. I've literally had people say more than once. I asked this question of myself, who am I really? When I realized what adoption meant to me. And while it is a validation of the title of the show and, and why I came up with it, um, it speaks to the notion that a lot of people who are adopted have not necessarily had an opportunity to fully explore who they are and realize it because they've been transplanted from one family to another and, and basically given an alternate identity. And it, it can be challenging for folks to overcome that alternate identity piece. They want to know what was my birth name? What, what might I have become had I stayed in the family where I was born? Um, so there's that piece of just quite literally, who am I really being a question that folks ask? I think another one that's common is this desire to search. And I think that it has varying degrees for different people. Mine was very acute. When I had, when our son was born, that was a moment in time where it just happened. Uh, but other folks have told me that they've wanted to search, but for lack of better words, life gets in the way, right? I am a teenager and I've been told I can't look until I'm 18. I'm now 18, I'm going to college and I don't have the money to start a search. So I have to delay more. I now am married and I've got kids and I'm in graduate school and life is in the way and it's just not the right time. So there's a lot of that sort of people wanting to search but not necessarily getting the moment to do so. Whereas other folks stop everything, drop everything, stay up all night and they're investigating as much as possible to try to initiate this search in this moment right now. So there's, there's that piece of wanting to search. And, and I think there's another faction of folks out there. These are guests that I will never have on the show because they're not ready to talk about this yet. Mm -hmm. They haven't explored it. They push it down. It's not something that you can have an, an open conversation with some adoptees about because they're just not there. Their mom is their mom, even though she's their adopted mom. And I'm, I subscribe to that. Um, but but they're just not ready to explore it in a deep way. So uh, I think that there's, there are different factions of folks who have different levels of awareness about what yeah. adoption means to them and how much they would like to search. You brought up a couple things here that I think, you know, have my brain spinning. <laughs> First of all, you said, who am I really? So I'm not adopted. I was not adopted. Um, and I grapple with that. Already having all the pieces hmm. of knowing who I am and where I came from. And maybe it's more, what am I here for? Right? Ah. Um, which is a little bit of a different question. Mm -hmm. But I'm coming at it, at it knowing who I am and... I have all the pieces yeah. and I'm imagining now grappling with that question, not even knowing those basic things really, mm -hmm. right? And how different that would be to ask myself, what am I here for? What's my purpose? If I didn't have all of those pieces, yes. if I had some of those pieces missing, it and so that's a very complex layer to the whole thing. You're absolutely right. I think many of us go through an existential sort of question asking process about ourselves, right? What yeah. is my higher purpose? Mm -hmm. I'm good at these things. I connect with people in these ways. What am I here to do? What am I meant to do? That's one piece of who we are is trying to figure out the pieces that we have and turn them into something meaningful that's fulfilling to us. The other piece, though, that is extremely unique to the adoptee community and several other types of communities, the um, the folks, there are folks out there who are donor conceived and a variety of other sort of types of family formation. The, the question of who am I really is far more fundamental because you, Becca, could turn to your dad and mom and say, tell me more about grandma. 
and her mom. And you have a direct connection and lineage to those stories because you are genetically connected to the people that are being, that the stories are being told about. Yes. When I turn to my adoptive parents and say, tell me more about your mom and her mom, what ends up happening is I'm being told a story about people that I'm not genetically related right. to. Right. It's a beautiful story. Exactly. It's a story that I have adopted as my own, but I know that I am not connected to. And therein lies the difference is when we think about family trees, we recognize how deep the roots go. But when you read, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this. I'm, I'm using this analogy in the book I'm writing of, of grafting. You can cut off a branch of a tree and you can actually attach it to another tree if you do it correctly and it will grow. And so I've seen fruit trees where you've got, you know, grapefruits with, you know, just regular oranges on it. Well, you name the combination. The point is an adopted person is grafted from one family tree onto another family tree and, and the genetic connection does, does not hold up. And so people often want to know what was the orchard from which I originally came is kind of the analogy, right? I love that. I've heard yeah. you talk and, about and, this. And uh, to, to push it a little, just a little bit further, I'll say this also. There is a massive interest in ancestry DNA, right? 23andMe, these platforms where people can learn more about themselves. And if it was only for adoptees to be curious about, there wouldn't be over a hundred million people, you know, or whatever the number is on these platforms. It's a curiosity that we all hold about ourselves to learn more about where we came from. What was our family's trajectory through this world's migrations? And, and how does it relate to how, where I stand right now in my life? And if that is such a fundamental question for people who grew up in their blood family, Imagine how fundamentally it strikes people to the core who were adopted, transplanted from one family to another. Yeah. And it's something I will never understand. Before we go on, we're going to take a quick break, but don't go away. We still have so much to talk about. Hey there, Adoption Roadmap fam. Are you ready to take the next step on your journey to parenthood? If so, head over to our website and take our quiz. It's called, Are You Ready to Adopt? It's not just about testing your knowledge. It's about making sure you're emotionally and practically prepared for the beautiful, complex journey of adoption. Let's make your dream of parenthood a reality. Go to rgadoptionconsulting.com and take the Are You Ready to Adopt quiz today. That's rgadoptionconsulting.com. The quiz is free. And it will let you know where you are in the process and if you're ready to jump into your adoption journey. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. The other thing that when you were talking before, you said your um, interest in searching didn't come until after you, your, the birth of your son. Mm -hmm. First That's biological it. relative. I yeah, tell me about known. that. So no interest previously? And, Not really. And, and why? Why that? I, yeah, sure. Great question. I, I'll go back to something that I said previously, which is the notion that my adoptive mom was my mom, right? Mom is a job. It's a role. It's, and if the person, my birth mother, while I loved her and was amazing, she was not there when my nose was running, when I skinned my knee, when I had to go to soccer practice, when I was screwing up in school, right? My mom did the job. And that I think is incredibly important. And I'm not subtracting anything from what we also, we call them birth mothers and first mothers, because you can't get to this earth without having had that first mother. She did a role. She chose to carry a child to term and deliver that child. Her second choice in that chain then was, am I going to be the parent of this child or is someone else going to be the parent of this child? And it was that second choice that placed me with my adoptive family. So they each had two different roles. 
my mom was fantastic. Veronica was an incredible person and, and I loved her dearly, but I think it's important to think through what the role of mom and dad are as the person who do people who do the job. And there's a separate set of parents who are the ones who contributed to your life being here on the plane. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's kind yeah, of- Yeah, no, you did. You did. And I just, I, I always find it very interesting what sparks somebody's search. If it, if it was something that they always, from the time that they were old enough to even understand that they could versus is yeah. not. Um, can you share a story from any of your interviews that particularly touched you or offered an insight that was unexpected into the adoption experience? Becca, that's a tough one because I got to tell you, they are all unique eye opening experiences. I could rattle off a gang of them right now. One of the first ones that comes to mind for me for some reason is a woman named Tezata who was adopted out of an African country. I want to say it was Ethiopia and I think the reason her strikes me so much is because of how much she endured as an individual. So she was brought, she was born in an African village, black folks all around her, never seen a white person her entire life. Unfortunately, she was placed into an orphanage at which time she was brought to the United States to be adopted by white people in California. Unfortunately, these people were unkind to her and they, you know, so there's a language barrier. There's a color differential. She told me on the show, I literally thought these people were witches because I'd never seen white people before. Right. But this is the culture that she came from. If you're not exposed to something, then you're, you're ignorant to it. And therefore it, it could scare you. She said they brought her a big, huge stuffed animal. She'd never seen that before. And it freaked her out. They had a language barrier and I'm sure she was scared and crying. And so that would have stressed her parents out, which would have made her seem like a troublesome child. They locked her in the bathroom, you know, fed her under the door or whatever the, the awful situation was and eventually rehomed her back to Africa. Uh, but one of her adopted sisters grew up, always remembered her sister and went and found her in Ethiopia and reconnected with her and helped her return to the United States. I mean, it was just an unbelievable story of an individual's resilience to, you know, try to make it in this world, given the circumstances she was put through. But I've heard other amazing stories that I, I mean, it, my brain is struggling because there's so many. I've heard people say things like, I always had an interest in motorcycles and I was walking down the street one day and I saw a motorcycle jacket in the window and I had to buy it. And I had no idea why I don't even own a motorcycle, but I just had to have it. And she found out later that her father was totally into motorcycles. I've heard the same thing about horses. I've a heard this told me so that she had many times. Unbelievable connection to, I believe it was the city of Rome and the, the, the country of Italy. And she did not grow up thinking she was of Italian descent and found out that she was. I talked to a guy recently who was a police officer for many, many years. And when he found his biological father, the gentleman was in prison. And so here you are a cop and your dad is a criminal. But, and so he went to visit his father in prison. It was a huge, I want to say it was a maximum security prison, but I'm not sure in Louisiana. And he said he went into this meeting thinking to himself, I'm going to take this slow because I don't even think I want to know this guy, right? I'm a cop. He's a criminal. We're not cut from the same cloth. And so he went in with his guard up, but he realized after speaking with him, seeing sort of his relation to this gentleman that that's his dad. And so he ended up being part of the parole process to get his father out of prison. And he was there on the day his dad walked out of jail and his dad got his first hug as a free man from his own biological son. So this is why I'm telling you, it's so hard to just bring one story. Oh, I have chills. They're so fast. I mean, yeah, they're fascinating. Every time I sit there and I'm interviewing someone and I think to myself, oh, I know where this is going. 
it's like they're driving down the road and they yank the steering wheel and we just go off-roading all of a sudden. I mean, it's just bananas. And talk about common themes. For me, I hear that kind of stuff all the time also from people who are there like, I just talked to a client and they found out they had other sisters and that they had never met and somebody placed somebody anyways. And, and they were like, exactly the same person. Yeah. They, they both adopted children. They both had the same, they lived two blocks from each other. You know, mm -hmm. all this stuff that's so in your nature, right? The whole nature versus nurture and in genetics and, and biology is huge. It's huge. so fascinating. Right. Um, were you all always comfortable sharing your story publicly or were there times that you felt uncomfortable with your, with parts of your story? I always felt comfortable with it. And I think that's because I grew up with the knowledge. My parents were comfortable talking about it. And it, it was just part of me. So... I think there's a huge difference where for anybody who's not adopted, one of the challenges can be something we call late discovery adoptees. So this is a person who was adopted, but did not grow up with the knowledge. And suddenly there's a moment when they figure out or are told, or it is revealed that they are adopted. And I've had several of those on the show too. One guest told me that he was at a birthday party for a family member and this little old lady, one of his little aunts, sort of leaned over to him and said, I remember when they adopted you. And he was like, what? This moment of being at this birthday party turned into this life-altering revelation. There's other people who have said, I, there was a, young, a woman I spoke to recently, she said she was just... At home one day of Saturday morning, she's watching Soul Train and her parents came in and said um, that they wanted to tell her something. And they revealed to her, she's like seven, maybe 10 years old, that she's adopted. That's a late discovery adoptee too, in my mind, right? Because you're not talking about it early enough. I'm, I'm able to make the leap in my mind. Wait, you're telling me you're not my parents' parents? And so there's other folks who are late discovery adoptees who come along and, and unfortunately they will the revelation will happen at a time when a parent has passed. And so there's, they end up learning and now they don't get to ask any of the questions that they would have liked to have if their parent was alive. How come you never told me? Why did you adopt me? Do you know who my parents are? Any, tell me where I can find information. All of that is completely wiped away and they have to go to secondary sources of information, aunts, uncles, searches online, et cetera. It's really tough. So I say all that to say, I was really lucky because I was introduced to adoption and, and made comfortable with it, both by the early onset of the information and the level of comfort that my parents acknowledged our family formation with. If they had been kind of weird about it when someone asked about it, then I would have been kind of weird about it too. You know what I mean? I would have taken the signal from them. A hundred percent. But I was perfectly fine. I love that you brought this up. And I think it's really important for hopeful adoptive and newly adoptive parents to really hear. Um, one of the things we talk about post-adoption, we usually have kind of a wrap up with our, with our um, families, even though that's just the start of a new adventure. And we say to them, start telling your child their story today, day one, you are going to fumble there are going to be triggers in you when you use certain words. You know, think about the questions that people are going to ask you. How do you want to respond? Yes. All of those things now. And look, I really, hopeful adoptive parents, I really want you to hear what Damon just said, that the reason he's been comfortable with his own story is because his parents were. Mm -hmm. They were comfortable with it. Or they talked about the pieces that weren't. And by doing that from day one, you really set the stage for, for how your child's going to feel about their own story. I'm wondering, Damon, was there, I know you wrote an autobiography also mm -hmm. called Who Am I Really? An Adoptee Memoir. We will link to all these things in the show notes. Was there any, or what was the most challenging part of writing that autobiography? <laughs> 
Because I know, I, I know there was at least some. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's a real life story and it yeah. had multiple, multiple ups and downs. So I'll tell you some of the story just to give you some highlights so that you can see how challenging it was. It, we've already talked about the birth of my son. We haven't talked about the fact that I'm an adoptive parent myself. So we adopted my niece and nephew on my wife's side of the family. And to make a long story brief, that was very challenging. We adopted them at nine years old each. So they had already had a set of life experiences before they joined our family. And those were not awesome experiences either. And so they came with adoption traumas that we needed to acknowledge, help them work through and, and move on as a family. And it was very, very tough. So there was that piece. There was the piece that you mentioned in the intro. I grew up with a wonderful adoptive mother, but unfortunately, I started to lose her to paranoid schizophrenia and dementia. Mm. And so our relationship deteriorated dramatically. And it was in that same period of her mental deterioration that my son was born. And it hurt me so much that her mental state prevented her from really getting to know my son. I think I have one picture of the two of them together oh, wow. because she couldn't bring herself to my house because of what she was perceiving in her altered reality. So that was really tough to write about, just the, the challenge of losing someone you love to mental illness at the Oof. same time, separately, but at the same time in parallel as thinking to yourself, you know what, I kind of think I wanna find my biological mother, not because I'm losing her, but because I have a child here and his relation to me has made me realize I have a relation to someone else that I don't know. That was hard. Uh, the piece about our own infertil infertility, right? I, I talked about it before. It's a topic that is not very openly discussed. It was driving part of the baby scoop era back in the day, but that's a very personal thing about our family that I revealed in, in my book. And but I, I chose to do it because it's a hard topic to discuss and mm. people need to recognize they're not the only ones going through this and, and just hear how someone else managed it, survived it, um, whatever. Another huge piece that was hard for me was, you know, my adoptive father died. He was, you know, a hero for me. And he was just this wonderful character, not just for me, but for, hundreds of other people who just loved this guy. And it was not long after his death that I was writing this book. And there were days when I would sit down to the computer, I couldn't even see the screen. I was in tears. Right. But so you just go to another part of your story and you come back eventually to when you think you can handle it. Um, but it was, well, it's also hard because it's a hard, long process, right? It's not a sprint You don't <laughs> just sit down over a weekend and like throw together your book. You really have to think through what's my message. What am I trying to tell? What do I want people to know? And what do I not necessarily think needs to be included? So some of the self-editing is also challenging, but the hard human stories are, were the big piece. So is some of those parts of your story, it was the first time that you were sharing them. No, I'm a pretty open family. person. Okay. It's just, it's not that it's the timing of sharing, it's the depth in which you have to go into mm -hmm. the story to make it, it something that's going to be interesting to people, right? Okay. So yeah. you have to figure out how much of this do I actually want to tell? How much detail do I have to go into? Because I've got the deep, deep, deep details on it, uh, but, but how much, and I have to think through all of them in order to figure out what goes in the book. And that is the challenging part is you have to relive a lot of challenging situations, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, congratulations for, for doing that. And it sounds like you're writing another book you alluded yeah. to at the, at the beginning. Wow. Yeah. You, uh... <laughs> if I could, Becca, I want to go back for a moment because you said something that sparked for me. And I just want to yeah. make sure that we sort of speak to Please. the prospective adoptive families out there. Yeah. You, astutely pointed out that people need to practice what they're going to say. And I think that's incredibly important because there are going to be multiple situations that you will need to have practiced what your position is. And you don't always have to have the answer. I want to encourage people to realize you might not have the answer in the moment and you need to grant yourself space to get to an answer. And it will change. 
and and it will change and it's yeah. going to be things like <clears throat> your child is going to come to you and ask you about their adoption you need to think ahead of time what your answer is about that there's going to be a time when someone in public is going to ask about you and your child's adoption and you should have a pre determined answer there because you want to be able to rattle it off relatively quickly with ease and comfort and feel confident and be able to quickly turn and, and acknowledge your child's feelings and comfort them and just see where they are based on what was happening. And if you read that they weren't really impacted, great. You don't need to make a big deal of it in the moment, but you should definitely take a moment to give them an eye and see how are they doing and acknowledge too for yourself that that situation might come up later. Yeah. What happens with kids is they don't have the language for their curiosity in the moment and they don't necessarily feel empowered to speak up. But when they're sitting in the backseat of your car and their little legs are swinging and they're thinking about something as they look out the window, they will blurt out a question that you never saw coming. And so you should think through what your responses are going to be. And then finally, I think you should also think through what you're going to say when they eventually come to you and say, I think I want to search for my biological family members because while they may not say it to you out loud, they've probably thought about it. And what will happen is, as we all do, you get an idea. The first thing you do, you pull out your phone and you start Googling stuff, right? I wonder how many stars are in the sky. Let me go to Google. I wonder where my birth mom is. Let me go to Google, right? And so you need to think about the day when your child, your teenager, your adult child comes to you and says, hey, could I talk to you about this? Or, hey, I need my adoption record or whatever it is. And this is the part that I think you need to allow yourself to, to grant yourself some space. Because it could be hard if you haven't prepared yourself. And you could just, it's okay to say to them, I thought you might ask about this one day. Do you mind, can you give me a day to just think about this and then I'll, I'll come back to you tomorrow or I'll come, give me an hour and I'll, I'll come back to you on this. It's okay to not necessarily feel okay in the moment, but I think you do have to acknowledge it and, and be part of it because if you don't adoptive parent, what will happen is that adoptee is going to go ahead without you because they're doing it. If they've come to you and said it, They've thought about it enough that they're probably going to do it, whether you are supportive or not. And I think it's better for you if you can find yourself in a place of being supportive because what you will then have done if you're not supportive is sliced yourself out of a significant piece of your adopted child's life. So... Mm. I'll pause right there, but I just, I really want to encourage okay. people to think about the hard stuff ahead of time. Yes. This is like, you know, buying insurance. You never know when something's going to go wrong, but you'll be glad that you were prepared ahead of time. Mm. So, so good. And one of the reasons why I say it changes is it depends on the age of your child too. So, and you also, when you're caught off guard, for instance, by other people, you have to decide, is this an educational moment? Is this a, I want to fuck with you a little bit moment yeah. and have some fun? Right. Or is this a moment where, okay, my child's old enough, my answer is really going to count. I remember my child's Mexican and I'm white. And I remember early on, <clears throat> I walked into a store and it was a Mexican store. And the guy behind the counter looked at me, looked at my son, looked at me and said, is your husband Mexican? And I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of shrugged like, I don't know. I don't know what happened here. Yeah. <laughs> and he Good was luck so figuring perplexed. that out, buddy, because I'm not giving you any other Yeah, answers, he was right? so perplexed and I just yeah. walked out and I just didn't feel like it. And there are other times where I do feel like it. And other times where now that my son's old enough, I'll look to him and I'll be like, how do you want me to answer this? You know? Yeah. Um, and, and that's then a there's... Point too. I'm glad you said that too, mm -hmm. that there is a time in a child's life when they should have ownership and empowerment of their own story, right? 
a lot of times we post our children online and things like that. And we're sort of lauding what's happening in our lives. But for adoptive parents, that can be a little bit challenging because uh, you can accidentally turn the child into a trophy. And that's a hard th I'm not saying don't post. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is be thoughtful about how and how much you talk about the adoption because there are days when you just don't want to be adopted as a person, right? It's not that you don't want to. It's just like, like that's not the first thing on my mind. So let me translate that into a different situation. If, and I'm not, but if I was a cancer patient, I wouldn't necessarily want to talk about cancer all the time. Sometimes I would just want to be a regular guy, right? But if you're constantly talking to me about my cancer, then I will never be able to think about anything else. And so I translate that to the adoption situation where if you're online sort of constantly posting photos and saying how glad you are to have an adoptee and all this, whatever it is, like just don't overdo it because the kid just wants to be a kid is kind of what I'm saying. They ultimately just want to have family. They want to have guidance. They just want to fit in. And if you're constantly saying you came to my family through an alternative means, you're going to accidentally alienate them in ways that you didn't even calculate. So just be a family. You don't have to overlaud the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have so many questions. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm going to ask this one. Do you remember or are there any stories from your parents about any of the questions that you asked them? Like, do you remember a time that, oh, I asked this question to my parents and maybe looking <laughs> back, you're like, well, oh, I know that was a doozy. Yeah, I'll give you two things that come to mind for me because one was positive and one was negative. I'll okay. Start, I'll start with the negative. And this was on me. And I will preface this by saying I was being, I was an ugly teenager, right? But I want to, I want to reveal. You're so this. handsome. <laughs> I mean, ugly in the <laughs> inside sense, right? I was, you know, teenagers are jerks. They think they know everything. There's a bunch of smart asses. Oh, yeah. Sometimes not... you want to kill them. Yes. But you realize that would ruin your life, so you don't. So <laughs> um, I, I was just a – I was a – I said something really ugly to my mom. She said something about, uh, you know, how – this is a classic thing that parents do, right? Do you realize how much I do for you? Blah, 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 blah. And at that point, I, I don't remember what it was, but she had just gotten on my nerves. And she said something about adoption. And I basically said to her in a very ugly way, well, then maybe you shouldn't have. But we were in a fight, right? So we were saying ugly stuff. And I say that to say, adoptive parents, your child may say something that they don't actually mean. Probably will. We yes. We all have done it. This mm -hmm. happens in non-adoptive families. So when it happens, you can think, oh, this is that moment Damon talked about because it happens in every single family. Every person says something ugly to someone else and they go, shit, I wish I hadn't said that, right? So there's yeah. that. Now on the positive side, I will say that my mom, Veronica, was an amazing person. And one of the things that I really credit her with is she said to me from my earliest days that I can remember, if you ever want to search for your biological mom, I will help you. And I thought that was so interesting because like I said, when I was younger, I did not want to search. I hadn't had any sort of revelatory moment that made me think, yeah, I probably should find who this other person was, right? I wasn't, I was 36 when my son was born, but the reason I bring this up is because one, this is also a lesson for the adoptive families who are listening is be receptive to that notion, as I talked about before, but also she meant it. What was great about that was she told me that when I went out, I was a kid and I never thought twice about it. I was like, I don't, I always said, I have two parents. I don't need to find two more. I'm good. Like, how many parents does a guy need? But then when my son was born, it triggered 
And at that time, she was suffering from mental illness. And I was like, oh, crap. Now I need what she promised. I don't know if she's going to deliver, right? And fortunately, she did. I could, you know, for anybody who's lived with someone suffering from any of the mental illnesses that I've named, there are moments of lucidity with that person, right? They come back as their full self from time to time. And it can be really amazing when they do. And fortunately, I caught my adoptive mother at a moment when she was ready to be responsive. And I told her I wanted to search for my biological mother. And she said, oh, let me go get your adoption records. And do you know within a week they were in my mailbox? I couldn't believe it. And so I guess those are some of the stories from my childhood of sort of openly acknowledging adoption with with my parents. I get, I'll, I'll tell you one more story with my dad because this one's always, it's interesting to me. I alluded before to the fact that periodically we would be out and about and folks would say, oh my God, you guys look just alike. And again, I'm brown skin. He was dark. We just don't look alike. And if you really closely examine our features, we don't generally look alike. But what I have thought a lot about is what I believe is what people were really seeing was our shared energy, right? We are, we're the same kind of guy. We don't look alike, but we give you the same feeling, right? There's the nurture part. Yeah, it's the nurture mm -hmm. part. But it's also interesting. I'm not huge into astrology, but I think there's an odd coincidence in the fact that my birthday is October 14th. My dad's was the 17th. We're both Libras. Oh, and yes. we have this shared sort of personality type that probably was able to be perceived by other people. So yeah. it, what was wonderful was that while my nature came from someone else, my nurture made me <clears throat> my nurture made me very much like him. And I, I loved that about our relationship. It was really cool. That's awesome. Ah, that is so great. I hope that you've been enjoying this conversation as much as I have. We've only just gotten started. Stay tuned for the part two episode in my conversation with Damon as we dive into mental health and parenting and what he sees coming up for his podcast. Part two will be next week, so make sure to tune in. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Adoption Roadmap podcast. If you did, I have a few favors to ask of you. First, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, I'd love to hear your takeaways. Please write a review and let me know what you liked. And if you have a question or a suggestion on what you'd like to hear, I'd love to hear that too please shoot me an email at support at rgadoptionconsulting.com and let me know what you'd like to hear about. And if you have a question, I may just answer it online. Thanks again for listening. Tune in every Wednesday and Friday morning for a brand new episode of the Adoption Roadmap podcast. Until next time, bye-bye.